your Bibles tonight, you can turn back to Luke 9. And we're going to get back into uh, Luke 9. We uh, read verse 62 off the screen this morning and uh, preached well over an hour on that. And the uh, message entitled, some I'll say, Fit for the Kingdom of God. Amen. If we're not fit, we're unfit. Amen. Fit, you find the word fitness. And if you're from South Georgia, when you're about to do something, you're fitting to do it. <laughs> so I'm fitting to preach about being fit for the kingdom. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. And somebody say, there's benefit. Amen. In being fit. Fit means prepared. It literally means to be in shape by way of exercise. Amen. So exercising. Yes, we spoke about a lot of things comparing the two between that that's physical and that that is spiritual. But some people are weak spiritually because they don't exercise their faith. Some might say they don't work it. And faith without works is dead, James 2.20. Amen. Some might say faith without exercise is dead. You have to exercise your faith. Praise God. And according to Hebrews 5 and 14, those that are strong in the meat of the word, that eat the meat of the word, they have their senses exercised. Somebody would say exercised. Amen. Praise God. In other words, they exercise uh, the word of God. They do it because if we don't mix what we hear from God's word with faith, that means do what we hear. Amen. It will profit Profit, profit us nothing. Amen. Some people's just looking for a prophet. Somebody to speak, thus saith the Lord. But friend, I'll tell you in the kingdom of God, that comes and goes. And, and Hebrews 13 says where there's prophecies, they can fail. But somebody say to really stay profitable, amen, to profit daily, you have got to exercise your time in the word. And when you read it, somebody say you must do it, obey it. Then your faith grows as you do. God don't give us faith just to speak about it. Come on, somebody. That's what the portrait of the person with their hand on the plow yet looking back is doing. Amen. Somebody say they didn't turn their back on God but they turned their face away and eventually they're going to turn their back. Amen. That is the first step to backsliding though their back is not turned away from God yet. Their face is. Face is the place of fellowship. Exodus 33 and 11. The Lord spake face to face with Moses as a man would his friend. So the face somebody say that's where the mouth is. That's where fellowship when you talk to somebody. Amen. You make eye contact. It's face face to face. So that's what that means. His face is turned away, not like the man plowing with the mule here in the picture. This person that Jesus describes just standing in the field, got their hand on the plow saying something, professing it, you know. And really we're about to find out in the context here is I'll follow you. That's what they're saying. I'll follow you, but I'll follow you, but somebody say a lot of people's butt gets in the way. That's why. <laughs> I just did. I didn't say nothing, did I? <laughs> Amen. Pray an outside joke. Thank God it was outside. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Their butt gets in the way. But, but. In other words, it's important, they would say, to follow Jesus. They believe it's important, but not the most important thing to do. There's a lot of people not really following Christ. They think they are, but they're not. Because to follow him, you have to literally, totally give up everything. Somebody say, to follow him, you got to forsake you. And I'm, I'm telling you, he said, when you follow me, I'm going to make you fishers of men. Mark 4, 19, that's going to be one of the repercussions. And I'm telling you, there's a lot of people being missed, being one to the Lord, because a lot of plow confessors, Hand on the plow, professors are not actually following Jesus. And, and I did an in-depth study. I, I got back in my office about 325-ish, somewhere there this afternoon from uh, going with my wife and daughter to eat. And, and uh, I just spent that time. And before I knew it, it was done 530. But I did. A, and, and, I, and the whole time I'm sitting there studying and listening to God and, and reading and, and searching and, and, and digging and, and, and I began to I said no wonder I just kept saying Sister Janice I said no wonder I couldn't preach this this morning I didn't know what I know now no wonder God had to split this thing up in two parts 
Hallelujah. I said, thank you, Lord. I didn't try to go on and preach. I knew I heard you tell me. Amen. That was, that was all I need to say was just from this one scripture. Amen. And, uh, and so I'm going to do something I don't usually do, but I, I went to, uh, putting all kind of stuff down. So I got stuff here. I'm going to actually read some stuff. Amen. That the Lord has just helped me put into perspective. Amen. To keep me going where I want to go because I'm not just here to preach now. I'm here to teach. And we're about to find out what it means to follow the Lord. And we're about to find out some three would-be followers of God. Some I'll say their intention uh, was pure. I mean, they wanted to follow him as long as it was convenient. And that ain't following Jesus. Uh, it ain't about convenience. And we're about to find out that uh, there's a lot in this so-called era and hour that are not actually following him. They think they are, but they're not. And I found out something this afternoon, and if you see a glow on me, uh, I, it's probably because I'm so wide anyhow and the lights are bright. I'm, I'm, amen, I'm a glow bug for the Lord. But um, I literally... It's been a while, since, but the Lord showed me as I looked into this and said, I realize how much I preach like Jesus. Boy, and it just lifted something off of me this afternoon. When I studied this, I found out how much I preach just like Jesus. Why wouldn't I? It's him preaching in here. Boy, I, I saw it all in here. Because, boy, I tell you, when you preach the Word of God like we do sometimes, Jezebel, son, she's constantly, you war with that principality, that power, that thing's coming at you everywhere because it ain't popular. And it's going to get less popular the closer we get to the coming of the Lord. Amen. Amen. To just say the absolute truth like men and women of God did long ago, long ago. Amen. Praise God. And I ain't trying to be some, you know, restored, uh, revised, you know, gospel preacher. I want to be like the old one. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. That'll proclaim it, you know, to the full. Amen. And, and, and not cowardly, you know, cater to crowds and cowardly back away from some topics and subject. And to just speak of sin, something is, you know, a general topic, but not really call it out for what it is. Like it's just a little shortcoming and it's just human nature. And, you know, they, they're doing that. They're not calling people to repent. They're just, it's just human nature. God understands you're human. You're human. Yeah, and he understands and he no longer winks at sin, but he commands men everywhere to repent. Acts 17 verses 30. Somebody say God commands repentance. That's New Testament. He don't wink at it. That means, it don't mean God's flirting with it when it, when it says wink. It just means God don't hang his head and say, and blink his eye like, <laughs> shut his eye for a moment. No, God's staring straight at him. Since my son died on the cross, he is grace. He is truth. I don't give you grace to keep sinning. I give you grace to repent and turn from your sin. Leave it to follow me. Wow. The message is even stronger. Hallelujah. And so we're about to look at this, and it's still the title, Fit for the Kingdom of God. Some might say fit. Some might say in shape. A faith that is exercised, a faith that follows. Uh, Hebrews 13 and 7 says, remember them that have the rule over you. I've had people look at me before and say, who do you think you are like you above us? No, I'm not above you. There ain't but one above you. That's the Lord. But in the spirit, I am over you. That's why God called us overseers. Anybody, I'm not above you, but I am over you. You understand the difference? The Lord's the one that rules and reigns. He's above us all. Even I'm under him. Amen. But under him, come on, I'm going to give you, I'm going to just show you this order right here. A lot of people don't understand order. Amen. In Psalms 133, it talks about how, you know, good it is, precious it is for the brethren. Somebody say the brethren. brethren. That means there's got to be a mutual, you know, <laughs> common ground and it's holy ground really. Somebody's in the spirit. The spirit's in them, the spirit's in you. They're in the faith and you in the faith. The unity's among the brethren. Unity ain't among the brethren and the heathen, the brethren and the world. Ephesians 4 talks about unity is in the spirit, it's in the faith. That's the only place unity that God talks about exists there. All right, come on. Because light and darkness have been divided ever since Genesis 1 4. Amen. And Jesus and Jezebel ain't going to sit down at a table and come to agreement. You can't drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You can't sit at the Lord's table in the Lord of demons. Or excuse me, the table of demons. Praise God. Lord, forgive me for calling devil demon. Praise God. Ain't what I mean. First Corinthians 10 verse 21 is where that's at. So, so here the Holy Ghost. 
this this is amazing what the, what the Lord is saying here. Amen. So uh, we're living in that era. We're living in that hour where there's a compromise. It's been called compassion. Compromise. But somebody say God's com uh, compassion has no compromise laced within it at all. Amen. And and so when you when you look into this, you see these three would be followers. And every one of them's intention, you know, is. You know, yeah, we'll follow Jesus. But really, when you study this, they didn't really count the cost. You know, they didn't receive an invitation, you know, like what's being given today to people. Some people are, are, are being invited. And, and, and let me just say it this way. I'm going to go into this before I, well, let me just stay with it. Let me just stay with it. Uh, I did some study today, and I read of a church sign outside of a church that, that once said it was called the Light Church, not the L I G H T Church, not the Church of the Light, the Light Church, the L I T E, the Light Church. Some might say the Light Church. Advertised on the marquee outside was 24% fewer commitments. Home of the 7.5% tithe. We don't even require 10%. 15 minute sermons. 45 minute worship services. That's how you know you had a lukewarm church. They worship and sing and shout and holler more than they preach. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Oop, bye. I know I just offended somebody. Hallelujah. Uh, we only have, you know, they say eight com commandments, and it's your choice which ones you want to pick. Think about it. Amen. And ain't that just like, sadly, you know, uh, what I'm reading to you is, it, it was a cartoon. It actually was a cartoon, but a fic fictitious, you know, portray. Uh, but it's really laced with a lot of truth, ain't it? Amen. Amen. And that's what people are doing. Many churches are lowering their commitment level to attract attenders. They're catering to the crowds, condoning things the crowd wants, and they're fitting the church for people, not the Lord. Making it comfortable for sinners. We shouldn't be making the church comfortable for sinners. We should be making the church a place where sinners can be convicted and be converted. Well, brother, they got to come first, but what are we getting him, them here with? Think about it. Pe people, amen, what are, what are we doing? Think about it. Many churches are lowering their commitment level to attract attenders. They're afraid that if they preach against sin, they might offend some folks. Some might say, not here. So they focus on the positive and they speak about sin only, like I said earlier, in most general terms. They don't really want to deal with touchy doctrinal issues because people in the culture want to be tolerant and non judgmental. That's why some churches, and I've questioned uh, even respectable ministries that are large and huge, in the last three years, their sin has been silence. What happened to them? Where did they go? They don't speak on nothing no more. They don't call out nothing no more. It's just like they've fitted in because they don't want to offend because people are so touchy. Amen. In the times we live, somebody say, these are touchy times. And they're concerned about offending somebody because we want the road book to stay where it's at because you know it's hard times and we don't want, you know, praise God, the attenders to not attend anymore because if we don't got enough parishioners, we can't pay all the, the bills and all the salaries that's required of us to pay. So Let's make sure we just keep people encouraged and, and just speak some good things to them. And let's just detour and, you know, maneuver around some of these issues we know that's going to offend somebody. Because, you know, the times we're in so touchy, people so culturally offended, amen, about everything. Praise the Lord God. So let's just steer away and navigate away from those things. Uh, uh, after all, aren't we supposed to be trying to get people? Well, I don't know. Get them or trap them. Come on. Some people's just bringing them into a trap. Hallelujah. And uh, so we got to be tolerant, you know. We, we got to show compassion. That ain't compassion. 
You know? Let's don't preach against abortion. Let's don't preach, you know, against the sin of homosexuality or lesbianism or transgender, whatever you want to call it. Hallelujah. The confused. It's, let's, not, let's not preach against, you know, adultery and fornication, drinking alcohol, smoking cigarettes, cursing, gossiping. I can remember a time uh, in, in, in the Pentecostal churches, main denominational Pentecostal churches, you couldn't even join their church, that denomination, without the pastor reading the committal, the commitments that were listed that you had to commit to to even join that church. It weren't just doctrinal things that you had to believe that Jesus was the Son of God and you had to believe and accept the doctrine of the church, but you had to commit. They had a book of commitments you had to agree to commit to. They would read them. I remember watching it done. They would read them. And for example, hey man, I was ordained bishop uh, for probably 12 years in the Church of God denomination. Served as a state team evangelist, hey amen, back in the early 2000s for four years, hey amen, with the Church of God. Still a respectable domination. Still got, got a lot of friends, hey amen. Praise the Lord God. God had a different, you know, route for me to go. And, and, and I left that denomination, uh, uh, resigned, so to speak, my, my uh, credentials. And I did it with a letter. I did it, you know, I didn't just leave. I, I left respectably and told no matter what people have said, amen, praise God. And somebody's got letters in Tifton and somebody's got letters in Tennessee to prove it, praise God. And so anyhow, I, uh, you know, I can remember a time when, when the pastor, you couldn't even join the church and get the, you know, the handshake of fellowship. They'd sing a song and if you joined the church, you'd stand up there and people come around and shake your hands. But you had to agree before everybody. As that pastor would read out that little old purple book, it had a little purple pamphlet, and it talked about certain, you know, commitments you had to commit to. Amen. To join the Pentecostal church, the church of God, back in the day. Amen. Amen. Uh, you couldn't uh, be one of these uh, social sippers. Social drinkers. A little toddy for the body every now and then. You couldn't use tobacco, smokeless or smokable. Come on, anybody here, Holy Spirit. There was a list of things, amen, that the Pentecostal church required, amen, and a lot of them did. You made your denominations, and some may still do that. I just don't hear about it no more, amen. On our list, things that people to join this church, there are doctrines there. You got to confess you believe that doctrine, amen, but at the same time, we got other things we're committed to, amen, praise God, that, 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 that if you're going to follow Christ, and, uh, and you got to be committed to him. There, in other words, there was a standard of commitment. It was not... Not just a confession of sin. Oh, and I confess I believe in Jesus. No, there was a commitment made. You had to, amen, make a commitment to a certain standard of a way of living after you confess faith in Jesus. Amen. Isn't it? Because because the Pentecostal church believes in saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. And I'll go ahead and tell you why some people don't get filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. They're not willing to be sanctified and separated from that stuff. Amen. And so and to be committed to the Lord and, and when, when they call on his name or after they call on his name. I can remember a time and I'm about to preach on some stuff. I know it's going to be touchy, but these are touchy times. It weren't long ago, I was talking to somebody and they was telling me about the church. And, and, and I said, you know, that's the church of God you go to. Really? I thought, how in the world can you be going to a church of God and you don't even know it's a church of God? I'll go ahead and tell you why. Because let's remove the name off of the building. Let's remove it off of the signs. There's people who are going to Pentecostal churches, hey man, going to a church of God, going to a of God. They're going to all these denominations, but the name's been changed. They ain't even got it on there. I can remember a time, I can remember in the 90s as an evangelist with a tent. My district pastor, which happened to be Franklin Peacock right here in Waycross, Georgia, he just passed on, hey man, and went to the Lord a, a few months ago, and I've preached revivals for him through the years. Hey man, a man of God and, and uh, and uh, so he went from this world. He's in the next. Uh, he's with Jesus. And But I can remember him calling me in his office, amen, as the district pastor over that very region. And he said, okay, I hear you doing revivals. That's fine. He said, but there's one thing I want to know. Do you got the Church of God emblem on the sign out there? We want everybody to make sure they know who you belong to, amen, and what you believe. And, and, and that it's, I said, oh, yes, sir, I got the emblem. I remember a time where they made you. You had, amen, to make that 
that visible. But now somehow it just seems like, you know, let's just go under radar. Let's go under cover. And I know I'm going to offend somebody preaching this and I didn't plan to go on it. Uh, amen. But when I asked that person not long ago, do you realize you're going to a church of God? They said, no, it's, that, it's a church of God. I said, yeah, how in the world can you join that church and you didn't know it was a church of God? How are you joining the church and you don't even know what they believe? You don't even know what the doctrine is. You don't know the Pentecostal standard, the old school commitment book, what you have to be committed to the church. You got to be committed to tithing. You got to be committed to support with attendance. And there's some things in your life you got to be willing to leave and walk away from. Or you couldn't even become a member. People say, well, that's religion. No, it's not. I'm about to prove to you Jesus required commitment to those who called on his name and said they were going to follow him. Amen. Amen. And so there's a commitment level that's been lost and not so much lost, but it's just been left. Why? Because we want to attract the attender. And so they wouldn't dream of practicing church discipline. That would be called too judgmental. Even some stuff I'm preaching right now, they call us intolerant, they call us judgmental, they're gonna call you all kind of names. Hello? But last time I checked, if you really preach, you're gonna be called all kind of stuff. That's, and that's what a lot of modern coming into the ministry, young ministers don't realize. You ain't coming into this thing for popularity. You're going to be ridiculed. ridiculed. You're gonna, you ain't going to be called cool a lot of times either. You're going to be called all kind of names. You're going to be defamed. Your name's going to be spoke against. Your family is going to be stalked. Amen. Everything you do, everybody's going to be watching you and trying to find something against you. Come on. And always speaking something about you that is not the truth and spreading a rumor and a lie. It, somebody to shout welcome to the ministry. Everything about you is going to be made public, whether it's true or not. People just can't help themselves. Some people are so bored, God called some in the ministry to keep them from not being bored, give them something to do. Amen. I used to tell people that. I reckon people are so bored they ain't got nothing to do but follow me and try to find something against me. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Me and Lynn first started dating. They was people that didn't even know each other. Live hundreds of miles from each other saying the same thing. How was that? Demons. Yeah. yeah. They was counting from when me and Lynn got married to when she was going to have the first baby. I said, count on. If you can count 10, that's how many months you'll count, baby doll. Hello? And that's how many months they counted. Come on, somebody. From when we got married, it was a little over 10 months, and here come Dylan. Amen. Amen. Just wanting to start something, stir up something. It's always been that way. Mama, from the first time he said, preach my word. It's been something ever since. And not just something, it's been somebody. Welcome to the ministry. If you ain't committed, you won't last long. Come on, somebody. People who said they're with you will turn on you. Come on, people that said they're your best friend, they'll become your greatest enemy at times. People will say things about you and do things to you. It, don't, won't, it won't even make no sense. Hallelujah. Sometimes you feel like you can't even get close to nobody because you're saying, Lord, is that going to happen? Or are they going to do the same thing? Hallelujah. And you have to hear your wife cry, amen, and get so, amen, defeated in her spirit and say, nobody likes us. Does anybody even care? Hallelujah. Amen. You're going to hear those things. It's going to happen. Amen. And your children's going to grow up and they're going to go to school and people's going to mock them and people's going to say things against them because of the way your daddy preaches. Come on, somebody. Oh, and they're always going to put you in that little so to speak, pedestal and highlight you. Some might say welcome to the ministry. But what Jesus is about to preach here, it ain't just for those that's being called into full-time ministry. There ain't no other kind of ministry but full-time, and I'm not talking about monetarily. There ain't but one kind of Christianity, full-time. Ain't no part-time. Some of the time, when it's convenient time. If I can squeeze him in time, that ain't Christianity. That ain't following Jesus. Following Jesus requires a commitment. Somebody say the only way to follow Jesus is to totally follow Jesus. There ain't no 99.99%. It's 100% or it is not true Christianity. Amen. So, so the commitment level has been, you know, brought lower by standard, you know, to attract the modern attender. As a result, we have many 
let's just go ahead and say it, and I'm not exaggerating, millions of churchgoers who call themselves Christians, but who are not fully committed to Jesus Christ and his gospel. They have so many opt-out moments in their walk with God. If it's convenient, if it's fitting to their schedule or to their plans, then I'll follow. And we're about to find out these three would-be followers, they all had this in common. Uh, I, I, in my study, uh, I found here that uh, uh, a poll was taken, a, a, a George Gallup poll. I don't know how long ago this has been. Probably needs updating. But it contends that fewer than 10% of evangelical Christians could be called deeply committed. Some might say fewer than 10%. Yeah. Even Webster's Dictionary a long time ago, I don't know if it still says that, but it talks about the amen corner. It says that's the place where the few in the church that are really zealous and surrendered to God worship. That's where we got the old state. Amen. Give me a, anybody in the amen corner. Because the amen corner was the loud corner. Them was the ones that was sold out. Come on. Come hell, come high water made no difference. The fire or the water didn't make no difference. Man, they determined. I'm following Jesus. Hallelujah. And so, and it also goes on and says, the majority of who profess Christianity do not even know basic Christian teachings. That means the Bible. And listen to this. This is what blew my mind when I saw this. And do not act differently because of their Christian experience. That means they have no changes. Psalms 55, 19 said they have no changes because they don't fear God. Because all that's told to them is the love of God. Amen. No preaching about the fear of God, which is reverence for God. They have no reverence. They have no revere for God. There's no, no respect for God. Love is just one-sided. He loves me. But there's nothing about them loving him back. When Jesus said in 1 John 4, 19, he said, or John did, he said, we love him because he first loved us. Jesus said, I love you this much. He drove spikes in his hand and he laid his life down. Somebody saying, if we love him, we'll love him this much. That's our life laid down. Now, don't hit your neighbor upside the head. Of course, we got a lot of room in here since the kids has went back. And say, we got to love him this much. Let me get up here and get us into a cross-eyed perspective. See the cross? Made Brother Tyler stand up back there. This is how much... Somebody say that means all. That's how much he loved us. He laid his life down. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. John 15, 13. And Jesus said, if you're my friends, you'll do whatsoever I'll command you. John 14, 15. John 14 and 15, he said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. You'll do what I tell you to do. Hallelujah. So this is not just the message that Jesus loves me. This is the message that Christ said, you must love me back. The same way. Hallelujah. And so that's been lost. Listen to this. It says 90% of parishioners across the country require less commitment than the local Kiwanis Club. Now, I don't know much about a Kiwanis Club. There's supposed to be a lot of them across the world. I don't even know what all that's about. I just know what the poll says here. In other words, 90% of parishioners across the country in churches today, there's a requirement less of less commitment than it is to join one of these clubs. In other words, they really ain't no commitment. All we care about is having the numbers. We want to look good on social media. We want to look good on TV. We just want to look good in numbers. You can go to the bank and say, we're about to plant a church and we're about to start a church. All they want to do is not talk dollar signs. They want to know how many you got. How many you got? I remember him asking us that. Amen. And then we pulled out how much money we had, which was a lot. Because God done went to moving. They quit asking us how many people we had. And we didn't have a lot of people then. <laughs> but we had a lot of cash. Come on. Because God was moving. Amen. So they stopped asking us how many people you, how many people you run. <laughs> I don't never get I said in or out. Because we do both. <laughs> if you preach the gospel, you're going to do both. 
Amen. Because everybody ain't going to like it. Who lied to the upcoming preachers today that everybody is supposed to get along with you and like you? In the middle 90s, I had a preacher sit across a desk from me in my room at my mama's house where I was still living. I hadn't been in it two years, and I'd done stirred up so many people and didn't even know I was doing it. Amen. He came and he said, I've been appointed by five or six preachers in the community to come and talk with you because we're concerned about you. And I thought, where are they at? They just ain't got enough of guts to come to. Amen. And he's sitting there and he's telling me, he said, wherever Jesus went and preached, he brought harmony and unity. Wherever the apostles in the book of Acts went, they preached. And I let him talk because mama taught me to be courteous and let people talk. And get. I asked him when he's finished, I said, are you through? He said, yeah. I leaned over my desk. Amen. And I grabbed my Bible, I guess, and I turned it around and shoved it across there. I said, what Bible have you been reading out of? You've been lied to. I said, I don't find that in this Bible. I said, if Jesus, and I remember telling him this, I said, if Jesus would have preached like you just described he preached that everybody fell in love with him I said he'd have never been crucified he'd have never been betrayed and we'd still be lost and in our sin I, I said I don't believe that I said that's trash it is not truth I, I said wherever the apostles went many of them lost their life gave their life for preaching the gospel and I said they didn't become that's when God first told me I said they didn't become popular until after they were murdered martyred for preaching boy that discussion was over Amen. And I ain't been in it too long then. But that was the wisdom of God spilling out of my spirit right then and there. Because that ain't your Bible. That, that is a description of not his church. It may be the compromising church, but that is that's not. Amen. Thank God Jesus offended the religious. Thank God Jesus stirred up the political in his day. Because both of them were used to crucify him. The religious and the political. And thank God that's why we're saved. Oh, hallelujah. But it weren't over. Three days later, he come out of that bar too. No, no life insurance for Jesus. Don't need to buy it. Don't need it for three days. Oh, Lord. Hallelujah. So let's read here in Luke 9. And before we get into Luke 9, 57, because I'm kind of setting up where we're headed here. In Luke 9, it starts off, you know, uh, Jesus is uh, verses 1, he's calling, you know, his disciples together. Matthew 10, 1 says he calls them unto himself. Some ought to say the togetherness, the unity here, is the call to him. Yeah. In Matthew 10, Matthew said in verse 1, he called them to himself. Luke, the physician, says he called them together. Some ought to say there's only one place to come together, and that's him. Him. Who's him? He's his word. His name's the word of God, Revelation 19 and 13. Somebody said there's only unity together under him. With him, somebody say his word. Uncompromised, because he is the word. Come on, made flesh, he is. And there God gave them the authority over devils and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and heal the sick. Now that word together is a word in Greek called convoke. Somebody say convoke. Somebody say it means to call together. Just like it says, together. But it also means to assemble together, to meet together. Some I'll say to assemble. Friend, that has not changed. I don't care what governments say. Come on, somebody. I don't care what pandemics announce. I don't care what the call is come together. Somebody say, and he gives power to cure diseases and to cast out devils. There ain't no power to heal the sick or cast demons out. Come on, somebody, unless the church comes together. The call ain't changed. Hallelujah. So we hear the call. Jesus is calling, and there's power being, you know, exhibited because of that. In verse 6, they depart and went through the towns preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. So wherever they went, they were preaching, and Jesus was healing through them. Amen. And, and we know how he took the bread, you know, and he, he fed the multitudes. It goes on. But then in verse 23, Jesus is preaching the gospel to them, and he said, If any man will come after me, somebody will say, If anybody's going to come after Jesus. And you can't come after him until you come to him. So this is the same thing. If you come to him, this is how you go after him. This is he's telling you. Let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Verse 24, so whoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Verse 25, for what shall a man be advantaged, or what shall he be profited, or he gain the whole world, and lose himself, or be a castaway? 
A castaway would mean reprobate. Verse 28, for whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory in his Father in the holy angels. Verse 27, but I tell you the truth. And he goes on and he's still preaching. Amen. Now that does not sound like a gospel that's been made famous in the hour we live. That is not the accommodating, catering to the people type gospel. Jesus preached the gospel and he didn't just preach his cross. Amen. We're about to find out in, in, in Luke 9, as, as, as you look through here, you'll find even over in verses 51 that his face was steadfast to go to Jerusalem. Why? Because he's saying, I'm going there to be crucified on the cross. So he's preaching to them the cross. But listen, he's not just preaching his cross. He's preaching theirs. Boy, that's somebody to say, if you don't take up the cross and carry the weight of the cross and it gets heavy, you won't be fit. You won't be trained. You won't be exercised. Come on, somebody. Be fit for the kingdom of God. Oh, just come to Jesus, the accommodating gospel says. But Jesus came, told them, said, repent and believe the gospel. Amen. Praise God. In Mark 1, 15, this is the same Jesus that said at the same time, Matthew 4, 19, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, you got to forsake some things. you got to repent. you got to leave. There's some leaving and believing. Anybody hear the Holy Ghost? That's how Jesus preached. And he's telling them, he's preaching a self-denial, not a self-indulgent message, not a message about self, I, me, and mine. The only thing he's talking about you and me about is you got to deny yourself. What is that about? Somebody say that's taking up the cross. Denying yourself. Somebody say if you ain't denied yourself, you lying to yourself. There's only one group of people that's really following Jesus. Those who have denied themselves. Somebody say to take up the cross. When Jesus took up the cross, they hung him on it. Somebody say to take it up is to die. Somebody say you die. You die to stuff. True Christianity is a death. It's a death of an old man before it's actually an experienced new life. Somebody say to follow him is to forsake you. That's what Jesus is preaching. So he's preaching here. You got to take up your cross. And he says daily. Boy, that's working out daily, ain't it? That's getting fit for the kingdom of God. Ain't it? Take up your cross daily and follow me. All right. And then he tells them if you know if you if you save your life, you're gonna lose it. In other words, you keep what you got a little bit. You're gonna lose what you got now. That's why people don't last. Somebody say they lose it. Because they didn't give him everything. Because the preacher's inviting him, just come to Jesus. Just believe. But somebody shout, there's a commitment. In this gospel preaching. Everybody that's calling on him ain't committing to him. Everybody that's confessing faith in him is not actually following him afterwards. Amen. Hallelujah. Because the gospel's been made less in its presentation. It has no repentance in it. It offers a righteousness without repentance. You can follow Jesus, but you don't have to fake, forsake nothing. Just bring it all with you and keep it. Amen. And Jesus becomes a pastime. He becomes something that's just of convenience. There's no cross in it. Come on. Hallelujah. Oh, it's got his cross in it, but it don't have a requirement, the cost, our cross. Now, oh, glory. Man, this is, this is powerful. So Jesus is preaching a message, you know, to forsake, to follow him. And this is in the same chapter now. And again, by verse 51 and 53, his face is steadfastly toward Jerusalem because somebody shout, he is stuck on going to die on the cross. That's what he's preaching. And he's telling them, you're going to have to do the same thing to follow me. You have to die to yourself just like I'm about to die for you. Amen. All right. And then we find we're going to skip on down to verse 57. And it said, it came to pass as they went in the way. Now, Jesus has got a crowd of people following him, listening to him preach this stuff. And it said, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Nobody's ever told you that. They will if you follow Jesus long enough. Oh, I'm with you. Now, this man had all good intentions, but he ain't counted the cost. He's probably watching Jesus, you know, take a boy's little sack lunch, a few fish, loaves of bread, 
seeing miracles, watching people get healed, the apostles is preaching. Oh, people's knowing who they are. They're becoming a little, you know, in a little notoriety here. They've followed you. And there's crowds around Jesus. So who knows? It don't tell us. But Jesus didn't call him. He just opened his mouth. Boy, his intention was good. Oh, God, I'll follow you wherever you go. And a lot of people in the hype of the moment, they make all these things that sound good. Amen. So, <laughs> Jesus in these passages, you're about to hear him make some radical demands. Some might say demands on his followers. Yeah. And just two verses later after Luke 9, 57 through 62, you'll find in Luke 10, verse 2, he said, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. All right. So, He's lamenting over the harvest being so vast, so great, but he can't find enough of laborers. Right here, Jesus is saying, if you follow me, you're a laborer. You're a worker. You, you're, you're a doer. You're not just a professor. Somebody say, God don't need no professors. He needs some possessors. Come on, somebody. People that follow him, that have action, that do. Amen. They ain't just something they talk about, all right, when it comes to faith in God. Listen, if Jesus had hired a marketing consultant or a church growth seminar, you know, invitation. <laughs> Gee, Lord, I'm, if Jesus would have been invited today to do church growth seminars, he'd have walked in there like he did in Sardis, the risen Christ in Revelation 3, 1. And he said to Sardis, by the way, whose name means Prince of Joy. So they're the Pentecostal church. They're the ones that claim they got joy and speak of them. Woo! full of glory to shout in church. But Jesus comes in the evangelist and says, your name says you're alive, but I say you're dead. Yeah. Jesus walked into a church that claimed to be alive and he told me he's dead. <laughs> Boy, Jesus just got right down to business then. That's how he preached. All right. So Jesus is, you know, <laughs> if he had had him a uh, marketing consultant, you know, the consultant may have said, Lord, if you want more workers, if you want more laborers in your kingdom, more people to follow you, you're going to have to be a little bit more realistic here, Jesus. Uh, you just lost three good volunteers in the chapter before. They were all willing to follow you. But because you demanded all or nothing, uh, they didn't do it. You know, but somebody shout, Jesus ain't in the marketing business. He's in the gospel business. And with him, it's all or nothing. He's not going to be Lord of some. He's going to be Lord of all or not Lord at all, period. Anybody hear the Holy Ghost? Jesus said in Luke 6, 46, why call ye me Lord and don't do nothing I tell you to do? Somebody say, unless you're obedient, he's not your Lord. Amen. And it's the same as not following him. And so, you know, and that's the way people market today. They, they want to market the church the same way. Come on, somebody. They want to appease and please, amen, the people to the point, amen, that they just reduce the commitment level and they just preach the first steps of the gospel and come to Jesus, believe on Jesus, amen, but they don't tell people you got to leave the sin. You got to repent. You got to commit everything. Somebody say it don't work until you surrender it all. Fit to show you some examples here. Somebody say three would be followers of Jesus. You're going to find there's more than three. There's a lot of people when they they ready to follow until they have to follow. Until they have to follow through. Follow on. Mm -hmm. Most people are committed, you know, up to a point. They'll profess. But then when it comes to actually following through. Anybody can make a promise, promise for a moment, but where it really is discovered whether or not you follow Christ or not is if you can follow on, come on somebody, as far as the long haul. Think about it. And we're going to get into that in just a moment too. Hell yeah. Man, I'm telling you, I got, I got blessed that in this. Y'all just hold on. I'm, I'm trying to teach tonight and not just get scattered out there. I'm, I'm still scattering seed, but just not as well. Hallelujah. All right. So Jesus didn't lower the standard for these three would-be followers. They were willing to follow him, but he didn't lower the standards just out of it because they were willing. All right? We're going to find one of them he actually called. The other two just, you know, had a good intention. Somebody say, following Christ 
It's like taking a class on the pass and fail system. What's that mean? There's no curves. Mm -mm. No markdowns. You either make it or you don't. Somebody say you either make it or you don't. Jesus requires to follow him. You got to devote everything that you are and have to him. And no, it's nothing or it's, it's all or it's nothing. Somebody say it's all or it's nothing. It's important to realize in these verses where we're going right here uh, that they're not just directed to those that's considering full-time, you know, ministry or whatever. This is those that's going to be full-time Christians because there's no part-timers. A lot of people just look at this, well, that's just people being called into ministry because you won't find out Jesus is telling them to go preach. No, that ain't just what it's about. Amen? Hallelujah. Somebody say, the only way to follow Jesus is totally. And we're about to find this out. All right, verses 58, when the man said, you know, Lord, you know, uh, uh, listen, let's go back to verse 57. It came to pass as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord. Notice he calls him Lord. I will follow thee whithersoever there goes. Boy, that is a big commitment. I'll follow you wherever it goes. That means, Lord, when it's convenient, when it's not. When it feels good, when it don't. But that ain't what he meant. It just sounded good in the moment. And he just spurts it out. So it makes me wonder if everybody that's saying this, are they really doing it? Because right here, Jesus is about to show us they don't. Hallelujah. All right. Mm. All right. In verse 58, and Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath nowhere to lay his head. Jesus was telling him, if you're going to follow me, you've got to leave the world. Jesus was telling him, this world's not my home. I'm not getting used to this world. I'm not getting used to here. I'm not looking for a place to lay my head down. Somebody say, the biggest enemy of following Jesus after you come to him is worldliness. The world. The things of this life. The cares of this life. Choke the word in us that was sown. Come on somebody and cause us to become unfruitful. Amen. Mark 4, 19 says, unfruitful. Amen. Unproductive when it comes to following Christ. Because things of this world grab our attention. Somebody say, you'll always have to guard yourself against that. Every day of your life. And there ain't but one way to guard yourself from worldliness. You got to wake up and do like Paul did. 1 Corinthians 15 and 31. If you're going to follow him, you got to die daily. You got to deny yourself. You can't reserve parts of yourself for the world. Somebody say you got to come out from among it. You got to let it go. Now is when folks start getting nervous. You almost feel a spiritual nervousness start coming. Hey Amen. Oh God, he's preaching that way. This is the way preachers used to preach. And I ain't trying to be a new different kind of one. Come on somebody, I'm going to preach the way they did. This way Jesus taught it. Amen. Somebody say Jesus is drawing a line in the sand, so to speak. He said you either on one side or the other. They ain't no straddling it. There ain't no in and out and back and forth. You either all the way or you all the way out if you ain't all the way in. Amen. Hallelujah. So this is addressed to everyone. This ain't just somebody that's wanting to get in, in the ministry. Huh? So in context here, Jesus is teaching you got to totally come after me. Totally surrender me. Jesus has twice, and we're about to find the other one here in a moment, announced to disciples, uh, you know, his impending... You know, rejection, the death. We just read it in, in, in Luke 9, 22 through 24. His face is steadfast toward Jerusalem, verse 51. He also, you know, taught his followers that the first requirement, somebody say the first requirement, follow him, you got to embrace self-denial and the cross. You can't be self-indulgent. You know, you got to be uh, sacrificing self. You got to say no to you. Here we encounter two men who volunteer to Jesus. And we're about to read about the others in just a moment. Followers, you know, they, they volunteer. Somebody say they volunteer. volunteer. You know, to be Jesus' followers. One whom Jesus actually calls to follow him. We're going to read that in just a moment. But we don't know whether these men responded or not. I don't believe they did because when Jesus started preaching to them, no, we don't want to hear it that way. Although, you know, the, the sense we get out of this is they did not just like what I just said and, and, and so Luke here he's not causing us to focus on the response though of the people 
these three men, these three would-be followers. He wants us to apply Jesus' words to our own heart. He wants us to focus on what Jesus is saying. Because I'm going I'm to go ahead and show you, this sounds like an insensitive Jesus. Some of the things he's about to tell them. And you may have had some, you know, questions about this chapter because I have myself in certain things Jesus said. He sounds kind of hard here. Don't, don't sound like somebody you would necessarily care to follow at first. But this is how he preached. I want to preach like Jesus. I want to say it like Jesus said. All right? So, everybody say there's a difference between interest and commitment. We're about to find all three of these would-be followers. They had an interest. And you'll find people a lot of times, they got an interest. They're interested in following Jesus. But they're not interested in committing to Jesus. When you're interested to do something, some ought to say you only do it when the circumstance permits. So it's out of convenience. Some ought to say it's convenience. All right. So, so I'm interested in following Jesus until it becomes inconvenient. There's a lot of interesting people. They're interested. But when it comes to committing to something, somebody say you accept no excuses, only results. Everybody say when you commit to someone and you commit to something, you accept no excuses. And you'll find out that these are a list of excuses these men are about to give Jesus. Somebody say commitment don't have many excuses. How do you know somebody ain't committed to Christ and they're not really following him? Though they're verbally saying, I'll follow you, Jesus. They're uncommitted to the level they have more excuses than they have commitment. Somebody say you can always judge righteously whether somebody's really following him or not by their commitment level. Because commitment is not based on convenience. Commitment, no matter the season. Boy, can't you feel that spiritual nervousness? Praise God. I call it conviction. That's what the Bible calls it. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. So, listen. There's some people that's interested. That means, Lord, long you know, as, as the circumstances permit me, as long as it's convenient for me, it don't really cost me nothing, as long as I don't have to exercise too much. As long as it's just, so to speak, brought to me easily, well then, Lord, I can, I can do it. No, that's somebody interested, but somebody committed. Everybody say accepts, no excuses, only results. Yeah. So there's many, listen to this, who think that following Jesus is important, just like these three would be followers. Somebody say all three of them considered it to be important to follow Jesus, but not the most important thing to follow Jesus. There's the difference in those who are committed and those that's just interested. Oh, I'll follow Jesus. It's important, but it's not the most important thing. If he's not the most important thing, you're not following. I know this gets me in trouble and makes people mad with me. Get in line. The devil's mad first. I ain't preaching unless I made demons mad. Come on. Hallelujah. Somebody say with me, if he's not most important, you're not following him. If he's not most important to you above anyone or anything, you're not following him. According to the way Jesus preached, I'm about to prove it to you. Huh? So these three men all thought that following Jesus, somebody say it was a good thing to do. Well, I meet people all the time. Boy, that's a good thing to do. But there's no commitment. They ain't really following him. They got their hand on their plow. The hand on the plow was the confession, I'm following you. I'm following you. But their face is turned away from him. They're not following him. Jesus' face was toward Jerusalem in Luke 9, toward the cross. But their face is not toward the cross. Their face is looking back at the world, looking back at somewhere or someone, not him. How in the world can you hair and make furrows straight if you ain't looking forward when you're doing it? Can you imagine how those furrows is going to look? People that's looking back, that's why they can't walk straight. That's why they can't live right. It ain't that hard when you're committed and you're really following him. Somebody say it ain't that hard. The way of a transgressor is hard, Proverbs 13 and 15. People walk around and say it's too hard to serve God. It's too hard to walk with God. Too hard to walk. It is hard to have heartily walk with God. Hey man, when you got your hand on the plow but your face is looking back. You can have the dirt of the field on your clothes, but that don't mean you're following him. Somebody say there's no fellowship there. They're not surrendered. They're, they're not totally committed. Right? So these three men 
All of them agree it's a good thing to follow Jesus. Two of them express their own desire to follow him. We're going to read it in just a moment. I keep telling you that because I don't want you to think we're just, you know, making up this stuff. Which is more than could be said of many in the crowds. They heard Jesus preach in Luke now. Hey, that's pretty good. Three out of hundreds. Wow. Was Jesus successful in preaching? He had hundreds of people following him, and they all went home. And three hung around, and all of them expressed, it's a good thing to follow you. We want to follow you. And he turned them away. Not because he desired to, but when he started preaching to them, the commitment, the cross. Kind of like the rich young ruler. He walked away sorrowfully because Jesus told him to follow me. You got to take up your cross. You got to deny yourself. You got to let it all go. Lord, I'm not. I just want a part time, you know, on the side. Some people think following God's just a, a side show. Something I do if I can squeeze in on the side. A part time job. Ain't no part time Christianity. Because we don't have a part time Christ. I'm glad he didn't halfway die. I'm glad he said it's finished, John 19 and 30. Oh, glory. Anybody here, Holy Ghost? Somebody say, You ain't following him until you're finished. Until you've left all of it. Left all of it. Or left all of you for him. All right. But while they wanted to follow Jesus, they viewed it as important. Again, it was not what was most important to them. And there's other factors here that we got to look at too. Look right here in Luke 9, 61. And we're going to skip back and forth. He went through this. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury the dead, but go thou and preach the gospel. Why did Jesus say that? Because in verse 59, another man, you know, is there. And Jesus actually said to this one, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go bury my father. Now, some would argue right here that that sounds kind of mean spirited. Did Jesus really say that? Did he really? Yeah, he really did. It's written in red. He really said it. Boy, that sounds inconsiderate. This is the same God. This is the God of the Ten Commandments. The fifth one is to honor your father and your mother. That's the fifth of the Ten Commandments. Jesus didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Matthew 5, 17. Some would argue he's destroying the law. He's telling you not to take care of your mother and father, but that ain't what he's talking about. I'm going to prove to you what's going on here. Let the dead bury the dead. That sounds hateful, don't it? That sounds like, you know, what Jesus was letting them know. I have got to be more important to you than anyone. Because let me tell you the truth about this. Why would this man be following Jesus if his daddy had just died? No, he'd have been in the bereaving process. He wouldn't have been, you know, out here in the crowds where Jesus is. You know what this really means when you study this in that culture in that day? They were taught and believed that, you know, even when their parents was elderly... They were to take care of their parents, which is, which is biblical. That's, 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 that's right. But here's what they did when he, when he said, you know, um, I'll follow you, Jesus, but first suffer me, allow me to go bury my father. His father weren't dead yet. What he was saying, let me stay close where daddy's at because I don't know how much longer he's got to live. And let me wait till he dies. I don't know when that is. Dummy, Jesus does. He's God. So let me wait for when it's convenient. And, and, and then I'll follow you. But Jesus said, follow me. He didn't say, follow me in a few days. Follow me after your dad, daddy dies. He said, follow me now and go preach the gospel. Somebody shout, it sounded a little hard. It sounded a little pressing. It was now. Not tomorrow. Not when things with your family gets better. Come on, somebody. Not when daddy dies. Now. Wow, Jesus, that sounds a little hard. And then Jesus said, let the dead, you know, bury the dead. Literally, that translates, let the spiritually dead go bury the physical dead. Jesus knew this man's father was not dead yet. Only Jesus knew when he was going to die. But the man wanted to wait around for a funeral. And Jesus is calling him to go preach a revival. Hello? Think about what people are waiting on. God, I'll, uh, you know. And so these are excuses. One excuse after another. Jesus warns the first one, you got to forsake the world. 
I don't have nowhere to lay my head. You can't have nowhere to lay. Does that mean I can't have a house? I can't have things? No, no, no. You can have them, but they can't have you. Come on. Well, Lord, I'll follow you. But, Lord, I think I'd rather sit on my sofa tonight. No, you ain't following him. Somebody say, when you follow him, your pastime ain't even yours. Your leisure time ain't even yours no more. That don't mean you don't have recreation and have rest. God's designed us all for, you know, like sometimes you, you have to do, you have to get away, but not away from him. Somebody saying, I know you're getting away to get refreshed, you know. Praise God, it ain't for retirement. Hey Amen. It's for a recuperation. Hey Amen. And a reviving and a stirring up to be able to have energy to do something for God again. A lot of people taking vacations away from God. They've left his house. They've, oh, but I'm following Jesus. But they ain't been to church in so long they can't even remember. They're doing the same thing they did when they was lost. They didn't go to church then either. Some people went to church more when they was lost. Since they so-called been found. They still lost. I was not a church goer. I didn't want to go. But when I started following Jesus... I've been wanting to go ever since. Somebody say, if you follow him, you probably going to follow him to his house. <laughs> no, not probably. You will. Amen. Hallelujah. So these men, Jesus is calling them to self-denial, not self-indulgence. Praise God. And so all of them are, you know, impulsive. Hey Amen. Yeah, I'll follow you, but they're not really counting the cost. So Jesus is preaching to them. So Jesus is spelling it out in front of everybody. To follow me means give up everything, even personal comforts that he enjoyed, perhaps, you know, that was took for granted. So Jesus said, I don't have nowhere to lay my head in this world. And he's telling this man here, you know, let the dead bury the dead. I'm saying, do it now. No, somebody say, no excuses. Somebody say, commitment has no room for excuses on the results. Jesus is calling them to follow him. Amen. Listen, Jesus didn't, so to speak, enlist them, call them with false pretenses. With, you know, <laughs> promises that he wasn't going to keep. Just to get people, you know, to follow him. You know. Jesus was letting them know there's going to be a cross. It's not going to be just easy all the time. Just feel good. Always like you want it all the time. There's going to be a fight. There's going to be devils. There's going to be battles. There's going to be a race to run. Somebody say a work to be done. Many hard things to endure. Amen. If we propose we're going to follow you, we must count the cost and understand. Salvation, he's already bestowed, somebody say at the cross. Without money, without price, he's already purchased it. Grace by the way, glory in the end. Whew, what a promise. Amen. Shall be given to every sinner who comes to him, but, somebody say, but. He will not have us ignorant that we shall, you know, not have deadly enemies. Somebody say, he's not telling us we're not going to have enemies. He's not having us ignorant about that and about the world's going to come against us in the flesh, the devil, and that many will hate us and slander us and persecute us if we become his disciples. Hallelujah. He's not telling us we won't never be discouraged and everything's just going to be, you know, blissful and blessful and praise God. Hallelujah. Never have a struggle because we come to Jesus. In my study, I was, I was reading about a uh, a story of, of uh, I think it was the Coast Guard, you know, and the recruitment. It was the Coast Guard Reserves, and they had recruitment. Hey, you need something? Fix it. Lay hands on it suddenly. Hallelujah. <laughs> Seeing it ain't a person. Praise God. And so uh, the recruiter uh, weren't actually honest when he would recruit. Unlike Jesus, Jesus is not enlisting and recruiting under false pretenses dishonestly because he's the truth so jesus is telling these people if you're going to follow me here's what's required here's what you got to do all right so the story of this uh recruitment into the coast guard i was reading this story and it, it says uh the recruiter was telling this young guy 
He said, yeah, come on in and join. And he was giving him all the benefits and all the good. And he found out the guy he was trying to recruit was a, a real strong reader. He liked to read a lot. He said, oh, yeah, we got a library on base, one of the big, biggest ones around. Oh, you're going to like it there. What he didn't tell him, he said, you ain't even going to get to come up to see if you're going to even be able to be qualified to even be able to go into it until after six weeks of boot camp. And then you got to be approved. And then if you proved, you don't get but an hour a week. But he didn't tell him that. He just told him, there's a big library there. I heard you like to read. Oh, yeah, boy, sign me up. Somebody said, didn't tell him all the details. Oh, yeah, didn't tell him all the stuff. I read one guy, amen, <laughs> this is funny, he, he came to laughing stock really when he showed up because they told him it was on the island somewhere and, and, and the, where the base was and, you know, big body of water all around said, uh, big places, you know, you could fish and ski and, oh, if you got some skis, bring them, you got your fishing poles, bring them, boy, oh, but what he didn't tell them, amen, that nobody on base would ever be able to do that. <laughs> But he was just trying to recruit him. And a lot, don't that kind of sound like, hey man, some of the things that's being told people, oh, just come to Jesus and he's going to do this. He's going to make you rich and give you a big car and everything's going to be just like you always wanted. Oh, sweet Jesus. Oh, you ain't going to never have to go through nothing. It's just always going to be a party. Everything's going to always feel good. Yep. Hey man, and it's almost like they present it just that way. Jesus weren't a dishonest recruiter. Come on, somebody. He wants us to know up front. Somebody say up front that he's enlisting us into a warfare against the powers of darkness, the warfare that's often difficult. If we're looking for a program where our personal comfort is our approach and what's most important, somebody say we should look elsewhere, says Jesus. Following Jesus must be more important than our personal comfort or our convenience. And there's a lot of people they can't follow him, Brother Rob, when it's uncomfortable. When it's inconvenient, they're not following. Because that's what Jesus requires. Somebody says what Jesus requires. The second man thought following Jesus would be important, but not more important than his family. When Jesus said, Follow me, he replied, Permit me first to go bury my father. Think about it. And his father weren't dead yet. I done told you that. That's, that's, he was just tagging along with Jesus. And he was saying, I'll just wait till daddy dies and then I'll follow. After my father is gone, really, is what he's saying, I'll follow you. Amen, I'll follow you. Then I'll follow. But Jesus is saying here, no, you need to let the dead bury the dead. Somebody say, follow me. Somebody say, no excuses. No excuses. Jesus don't have room for excuses. But if our commitment, think about it, if our commitment to our family is greater than our commitment to Jesus Christ and his kingdom, we got it wrong. We ain't following Jesus. My family important? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. But not more important than him. I meet men that say they can't follow Jesus, keep, they can't dedicate themselves to Jesus because of their wife. Vice versa. Wives say their husbands. Oh, it's because of somebody in my family or my da 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 I love Lynn, but I don't follow Lynn. I love my kids, but I don't follow my kids. I won't follow Jesus. Amen. Somebody said, that's commitment. That's commitment. Remember the man that gave an excuse in Luke 14? He said, I've married me a wife. That was the last excuse. Jesus just didn't give no more after that. Because <laughs> that one tops it. He's married a wife. Hello? You mean you got married and now you can't? follow Christ. You've got more excuses than no. Somebody say our families are important. But Jesus is preaching right here. He has to be more important. I watch people make decisions because of their family when it comes to Christ. You ain't following him. Hello? I watch pastors make decisions on their commitment to where he called them because of a wife or because of somebody in the family. You ain't following him. Hello? Anybody here, Holy Ghost? If you're committed to him, you follow him, period. If you have to follow him alone, you follow him. Whether it's popular or not. This is how Jesus is preaching this. Somebody say commitment has no room for excuses. Only results. Follow me. Follow me, he said. Follow me. Amen. Oh, glory to God. You've heard of it too. Families who get so involved, you know. With each other, 
that now I can't follow Christ because, you know, after all, we got to have a family day, and they always choose Sunday. You ever thought about it? It's always Sunday. Always church time. Hello? One's got the sniffles, and all five else has got to stay home and wipe the snot. <laughs> you ain't following him. I remember times grabbing mine, and I had to go by myself and take them to the house of God right with me. Come on. And they sometimes, yes, I had to stay home with Lynn if she was that sick or whatever. Amen. Vice versa. I'm not, I'm not speaking against that. But Jesus is telling this man, if you're going to follow me, you've got to let the dead bury the dead. Let the spiritual dead bury the physical dead. I require you to follow me now. And again, the man's daddy was not dead. He was just waiting for daddy to die. Probably because he wanted the inheritance and didn't want to miss. No, Jesus said, I said, follow me now. Mm-hmm. All right. Third man volunteers to follow Jesus with a stipulation that he first must be allowed to go home and say goodbye to everyone. Yeah. Verse 61. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee. Everybody say, Lord, I will follow thee. But. Somebody say his butts in the way. I'm telling you, you somebody say it. <laughs> Somebody say, when you really follow Jesus, you'll get your butt out the way. Somebody say, your butt will be put in its place behind you. <laughs> Some people's butts in the way, they're going in the wrong direction. You ain't following it. Somebody say, you got to be so committed that your butt gets behind you. <laughs> Lord, I thought some of you need to laugh in here. <laughs> Believe me, that just come off the cuff. I didn't know I ain't never heard that in my life either. All right. But with a stipulation, he first said, you know, Lord, I got to go home and, and say goodbye to everybody. And that sounds courteous. Jesus almost sounds, he does, insensitive again. He thought that following Jesus was important, but not important enough to let even other relationships that he esteemed important to become less important than his relationship with Jesus. You know, boy, I can't serve God because my wife, my husband, my family. Lame excuse. You ain't following him. People that follow him don't talk like that. They don't live like that. They're committed, period. They don't just have an interest. Interest. Oh, I'm interested in following you, Jesus, as long as it's convenient. As long as it don't require much more than, you know, Lifting of a finger. <laughs> Amen. Commitment is not about seasons. A commitment is not motivated by the seasons. It's, it's surrendered. Amen. Follow Jesus. All right. Lot's wife, you know, she couldn't quite cut ties with the city. She just had to take one little look back. Genesis 19, 26, she was turned into a pillar of salt. Luke 17, 31, Jesus preached a little short message. He said, remember Lot's wife. Somebody say, there's a lot to learn about Lot's wife. God's message to escape, don't look back. Remember Lot? That's what God told him to preach to him. Escape for your life and don't look back. That's why Jesus is saying to this man, saying, let me go back home. Let me turn back a little bit. That's why Jesus with the scripture here we started with this morning in Luke 9, 62. Amen. And he said unto him, no man. He's saying to the man that's giving him an excuse. And he's saying it to all three of the would-be followers. No man. He's talking to all of them. None of you. Having put your hand to the plow, meaning open your mouth, saying, I'll follow you. But you look back. Can't follow somebody looking back. He said, You ain't fit. Somebody say, You ain't in shape. Amen. You ain't prepared to follow me, is what he was telling. Amen. In other words, his followers must be totally focused on his purpose. They can't keep one foot in the world. And just in case things don't work out in his kingdom, they got somewhere to go back to. I made a man come to me one time. He said, Brother Marvin. God's called me, and he went talking about all the big things he was going to do for God. He said, what you think about it? I asked him one question. I said, if you've got everything you need to do fully everything you've just described. He said, yeah, I got it all. I said, throw it away. God didn't tell you. He looked at me like I lost my mind. I did. I had faith in God. I said, God never sends you nowhere where he's not required. 
where he's not needed. I said, if you got it all and you can do it all, he ain't nowhere near it. Because God don't send you nowhere that he's not needed and faith is not required. I said, if you dreamed it, you ate too much pepperoni pizza or something. I don't know what the problem was. I literally said that. Hallelujah. I said, but God don't give you things to do that don't need him to get it done. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. There's no sacrifice connected to it. It ain't, God, it ain't him. When you follow him, there's a sacrifice that's required on our part. Not a convenience. Mm, a sacrifice. Somebody say it's supposed to be a sacrifice. It's supposed to be a fight. And until you start facing that fight, and that fight's going to come every Sunday until you face it. It's going to come every time it's time to do what God says to do. Hell's going to fight it. Somebody's saying, you better learn to fight back. Amen. You better start pushing back, fighting back, and quit fussing with one another and fight back in the spirit and tell hell where to go. Because somebody shout, hell's pattering you. Hell's watching you. Hell and demons, come on, somebody are studying you. You've become their pastime study, so to speak. Let's see what will make them stay home today. Up, oh, yep, that worked today. Let's get them next week. And people start going and flowing into a pattern. And they start living a life of excuses. Somebody said they ain't following him. When you follow Jesus, you don't really got as many excuses as people have. The excuses become least and least and least because commitment overpowers excuses. And commitment don't even allow much room for excuses. And does that mean there's not times of legitimate excuses? Yes, yes, yes. Y'all understand what I'm talking about. But when it starts becoming a habit and a pattern, something you can be patterned by, it's almost like it's scheduled by demons. They know what it did last time. And if they can tempt you to do it again to get you away from God, somebody say commitment don't live that way. Amen. Oh, glory. Following him is not a task. It's not a second job. Hello? Somebody say it's everything. Mm. It reorders everything about your life if you really follow him. It's not about convenience. It's about commitment. When Jesus talked about putting your hand on the plow and turning back, He's not referring to someone who starts out, you know, in full-time ministry again. This is not what it's about just because he told one of them to preach. And it's not about leaving secular work for the ministry. I mean, you can use it there, but that's not really what he's talking about. Somebody say this is about full-time following because there's no part-time Christianity because we got a full-time Christ. He gave it all on the cross. And so... This is beyond that. This is about following him, period. The disciple that really follows Christ, they get their eyes fixed on Jesus and his cause. And they seek after his kingdom first, as Matthew 6, 33. How you know you're following Jesus? His kingdom first. If you can look in your life and his kingdom is not first. If yours is, you ain't following him. You got your hand on the plow, but your face is turned back. His kingdom comes first. What's his, his priorities, his purposes, they come first. Somebody would say that's one good way to study and take inventory. Am I really following Jesus? The commitment and in the following, there's a firstness, so to speak, and it's his kingdom. It's his first, not mine. Amen. Oh, glory to God. It's not a slice of life, not something around. You know, to round out my life, to make it balanced and equal, a bit nicer. No, oh, when you follow Jesus, he's your life, the center of it. Amen. Hallelujah. The very center. Hallelujah. He's not my spare time. He's my life. And when he's my life, my spare time ain't even mine. I'm thinking about what I can do for him even then. Hallelujah. Anybody here, Holy Ghost? Oh, praise God. The first man probably got caught up, you know, in a moment of utopia, so to speak, 
The crowds were following Jesus. Hundreds were being healed, miracles. He's taking a boy's five loaves of bread and two fishes, and he's feeding a great multitude. Somebody said it's an excitement. It's a movement of Jesus. The man wanted in on the action. And he just gushes out. <laughs> he gushes out, just blurts it out. Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. Jesus said, I don't got nowhere to lay my head just like the foxes don't have a hole and a bird don't have a nest. You really want to follow me? Leave the world. Yeah. Forsake everything. <gasps> really? No, Lord, I was just wanting to do a little part-time thing here. I, I don't really want to go all the way. I, hallelujah. Somebody say Jesus requires all. Oh, uh, and that last one gets me so. But, somebody say but. Let me first. He said, but let me first. Somebody say profession is easy. Practice over the long haul is the real test. Not everybody wants to stay with him for the long haul. Some of y'all is thinking, I feel a long haul in here tonight. Amen. Hallelujah. The distance from here to that door is still the same distance. Hallelujah. You can attend a great evangelistic revival meeting where the music is captivating. There's wonderful move of the Holy Ghost, as some modernists say, in the atmosphere. The preacher's preaching, motivating the people with the word of God and gives invitation. People start coming down the aisle. You feel good about what was said and you realize that now you need Jesus in your life. And they tell you to believe on Jesus. Have all your sins forgiven. You're going to make it to heaven. So you pray to receive Jesus. But does that make you a follower of Jesus? Did you really become a child of God at that moment? Maybe. Maybe not. I understand that following Jesus is living, not living for self. It's living for him. It's, somebody said it's about committing everything. It's not about convenience. There's going to be a battle with sin when you come to him. Sin ain't going to look right no more. It ain't going to feel right no more. It's going to be a constant warfare for temptation. You weren't even tempted before because you was just a sinner. You were bound. Somebody say you come to Jesus. All hell going to get broke loose from you. And going to be upset about you. Mm-hmm. Jesus is letting them know. Do you understand following me and clinging on to your sins are not even compatible? You got to leave it. You got to leave this world. You got to leave that stuff behind. You at war with it now. Amen. Praise God. Yes, it's a gracious gift. It's, it's, it's you know, merited us not by our works, but by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. But somebody say, once you receive this great gift, you must realize also the other side of the gospel is you're no longer your own. Oh, I've received a great gift. I've been forgiven. I've been pardoned. But you are not pardoned to keep you. You got to leave you. Jesus said, you got to take up your cross. You got to follow me. You got to leave it behind. Somebody say, I'm no longer my own. I've been bought with a price. Amen. Commitment to Christ as Savior cannot be based on good vibes. Boy, I felt something. And a lot of people, that's what they're following at. What feels good. And you can feel good and not be feeling God. Here's how we know if you're following him. Because when it don't feel good, you're still committed. You still can follow him. Anybody learning anything? I hope you burn. Amen. All you be doing is sitting at the house, reclining back, eating a bag of Doritos and drinking iced tea and watching a rerun or something, black and white. Hallelujah. Bowl of cereal, something. Popcorn. I don't know. Riding down the road doing something. Amen. So... We're learning, but God wants us not just to be ever learning, but to come to the knowledge of the truth. Right. Amen. Praise God. 2 Timothy 3, 7. So this ain't just about good vibes. Oh, glory to God. Somebody say commitment, not convenience. 
That is what determines whether somebody's following Jesus. Can they do it when it's not convenient? If they can't, they're not really following. To leave your options open so that you can go back to the old life and the things if they don't work out as a Christian, is to reject following Jesus. That's why Jesus said, you got to get your face. You haven't turned your back yet, but you got to get your face turned back in the right direction. Or eventually your back's going to turn. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna turn away. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Somebody say there can't be no place to revert back to. No place to go back to. Amen. Hallelujah. I will follow you, Lord. But everybody say, but. Somebody say, everything. After that, but needs to go. Mm -hmm. If you got a response to Jesus, well, Lord, I'll follow you, but. Your butt's in the way. Somebody say to follow him, you got to get rid of the butt. Anything after that, any excuse, and that, and that butt was an excuse. It seemed legitimate too. Amen. Hallelujah. The only way to follow Jesus is totally. I'll follow you, Jesus, but somebody stand on your feet and say, you must erase your butt. Brother Rob said, even when it busts out your jeans, <laughs> he had to go back home. <laughs> he, done, he got ripped. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. I told him to go back home or he'd have to sit down all night. <laughs> Hallelujah. Somebody say, but. That's the thing. When, when people really follow Jesus, they don't have as many but, many excuses as you hear in the hour we hear. Hallelujah. Lord, I thank you for your word that was taught tonight, and I pray what was taught be caught. I pray it be kept. Hallelujah. Lord, this kind of commitment. Yeah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. This is what we must judge whether or not we're really following you by. Jesus, you sound like a hard preacher. When I read this afternoon and as I was studying in depth in this and finding out what these words mean and studying little things that went along with this that was fitting and, and I just felt the anointing come on me. It's time to teach, not just preach. Lord, I thought about all the things I've heard throughout ministry and even some of the so-called gospel preaching, Lord, that's never presented your call to follow you the way you preached it. And Lord, as I sit there, it made sense to me why sometimes we have to preach the way we preach. Jesus, I'm not sure if you were standing here at a pulpit tonight preaching, you would be as popular as you were even in the Bible at times. Because Lord, when it came time for the cross, the crowds left you. Lord, you require all or nothing. Everything.